happened to my music? I was having such a good vibe. Oh, welcome to What Up Wednesday, everybody. Good to see you. I know I kept this kind of low key. I wasn't sure if I was going to go live, to be totally honest. And I know you shouldn't make impulsive decisions and all that kind of thing. But yesterday I was like, you know what? I really miss everybody. So I think I'm going to do it. So here I am. It is good to see you all. I'm going to fix things. There is going to be a lot of flying by seat of pants today. Fair warning. And I am going to try to keep this a little bit shorter. I've got a lot of things to get done. Um, later on, I'm moving things out of uh, an apartment that I own across the way. I got to get trucks and... Oh, but I'm here anyway, and we can talk about a few things that don't involve a lot of clips. So I think, I think we're going to be okay. Oh, uh, an Olympic retrospective. That's going to be our first topic, but we're, we're going to talk about sort of the impact that Tokyo uh, and the conclusion of the games has on the umpiring panels, on the leadership group at the top. And what's coming next for all of that? And, you know, we're going to be talking about how the pandemic has affected everything, all that good stuff. There was a topic that came up in the Discord that I wanted to touch on, which is what is umpiring talent? So we're going to get through that. I may have some rants for you, <laughs> as I always do. Um, oh, and by the way, let's... <laughs> Let's let's just test this out right now. I need your feedback. Can you hear this sound effect? I might have some rants. Oh, I can't hear it either. So clearly, you can't hear it. Here. You can hear that. I hope. Look, it's just that kind of day. It's just that kind of day. So yes, we're going to talk about umpiring talent. And then we're going to talk about giving two cards to the same player. Two green cards to the same player, two yellow cards to the player. What do we do about that? What does it mean? Let's get some consensus on that topic. That's what we're doing today. And it's not even going to be a Keely hour. I promise. <laughs> Let's see what's happening in the comments. I need to see who's, who's on board. All you gorgeous, gorgeous people who decided to show up. Rachel, hi. You're there. Um, the It's Merlot today. I have recovered on my sleep patterns. Thank you very much for asking. Everybody's been very concerned about me. <laughs> Maybe I talked about it a little bit too much during the Olympics. And I shouldn't have. It shouldn't, you know, be that big of a deal. But yes, I, I went through and I could actually add up how many hours of sleep I had through the two weeks. And it was a rather disgustingly small number. And I would do it all over again. I really would because being able to come... Uh, not here in the YouTubes, but to go into the Discord and live every day and have the conversations with you guys really helped me understand what you were picking up from the games, what was important to you, how we could have good discussions about everything that was happening. And it was just such an, an amazing opportunity. You just, you don't pass that up. You absolutely do not. So thank you. I am good. Scott Riley's here. Hey, friend. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> oh, I was just thinking that Mr. Milford, right arm, was saying that he was having Merlot as well. I was like, ooh, well done. Could be start of a new code. Yes. Good to see you all. There is a, yes, there is a wine emoji. <laughs> Rachel, do you think I would be on the internet if there wasn't a wine emoji? It'd be really wrong. And in and new tunes. There you go. It's like halftime on tournament live streams. I know. Oh yeah. Wait, I can put music on. Hang on. Let me do this. There we go. Background music. So I can vibe a little bit. Luke's here. Hey friend. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to check to see what happened to that song and why it got off on me. It was very sad because it's my new favorite song. One of my live streaming friends used it one day and I was like, what is that? I need that in my life. So I'm listening to it all the time, not just for live streams. Simon's here. Good to see you. And yes, please do check that like button. If you like it, look, I don't want it just to be a charity like. I want you to be here, have a listen for a while, throw in a few comments, and then if you're happy, 
If you're like, yes, I do like this, then hit the like button. I'd appreciate that. Uh, no one yes. I don't know. No one yes. Oh, so you didn't hear it and then you heard it. Okay. Simon's here. You've got the Euro Hockey 2 on one screen and me on the other. You're winning. Yes, you are, friend. Yes, you are. If you haven't had eyes on the Euro Hockey Championships yet, uh, Championships 2, it's Giesno? Giesno? Poland for the men, and I forget where the women's is. Anyway, the coverage has been really good. So the um, the resolution, the streaming quality, they've had a couple games where it was a little bit Ooh, but that's kind of what we expect from your hockey these days. There's just, there's gonna be a glitch and then everything's gonna be fine. So it's cool. And Nick Irvine is doing his thing on the men's matches in Poland. So it's worth getting on because he, He's just a delight to listen to. I love listening to his commentary. So, <laughs> Luke, not being a kill hour doesn't mean it can't be longer than one. No, I don't. I don't have time for... I can't. I have to pick up a rental truck at 2. And it is 2.09. 12.09. Sorry. Hi. Guinness and ham for Lou. Good to see you, friend. And it's not a Merlot-flavored tea. Disappointing. Hi, Mark. Uh, Prague. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate that. Good to know. Okay, so um, let's talk about a few things and I should have better organization. I'm going to have to dig around my scenes because I was going to talk about this in a Talking Tokyo episode. We just didn't get around to it. And that means that I... I had all of the graphics set up to talk about milestones that the umpires hit. And this was, I, I actually am quite disappointed in myself. Usually I'm really good at finding all the social media posts about what the umpires are getting fetted for. But because I wasn't on the socials as much, because I was in the Discord with you fantastic people, I missed some of the alerts, which is really bad. So let's see if I can do this. Ah, here we go. We have a few of them. Okay, so first one, Michi Meister from Germany got awarded her golden whistle uh, for 100 senior caps. Uh, early in the tournament, obviously it was a China game and I can't remember who the opposition was, but it was earlier in the tournament. So that was really, really fantastic. Um, so that you all know golden whistles are for only for accredited FIH sanctioned senior matches. So, um, junior matches like under 21s do not count towards that total video umpire games do not count towards that total. So somebody might have, um, like, let's say there's a random person that, you know, from the interwebs who has 112 international matches, but only 92 caps. And that's because there's a distinction drawn between senior, full senior internationals and the under 21s. But there you go. 100 matches for Mission Meister, which is awesome. And then later in the tournament, both Tomo and Lim, both guests on Umpire at Home, you can go see their episodes in the YouTubes. I should link to those. I will put up a card so that you can see those. They received their golden whistles as well, which was fantastic. And Carolina Del Fuente from Argentina reached 200. 200! A double golden whistle. They should have a better name for it. It should be like a platinum whistle or a titanium whistle or something like that. So incredible achievement and a lot of that comes from the fact that Carolina was at the top of the game at a very young age so when we talked about Lorene Del Forge in Rio being the youngest umpire to umpire an Olympic final that was absolutely true she was um, I think Carolina started her international career a little bit earlier than Loreen did, but didn't make a final until she was a little bit older than Loreen. So there you go. Um, I'm, I'm going to check back in with some comments. Stain's here. Hi, Stain. Goddars! Go 
daughters. <laughs> Hi, friend. Good to see you. Is this going to work? Oh, good. I don't know if any of my scene buttons are going to work today. It's just going to be a surprise. Let's be pleasantly surprised. Simon, how does Lim have a golden whistle? He looks like he's 12. You're right. You're right. He absolutely does. But yes, he's had a, a fantastic, fantastic career. And yes, I'm just, I'm, I'm so delighted for all of them. There's not a lot in an umpire's life that you can celebrate. And I was having this conversation with an umpire who will remain unnamed, um, who is talking about umpire retirements and how some umpires just like to just go, just go. No announcements, no nothing. And I said, you know what? I, I can understand an umpire having a different feeling about how they want to end their career and how they're processing the whole moment. I know I had a lot of feelings when I retired that I had to process on my own. And they sometimes just don't want to make it a big deal. But for all of us who support them and who want to be able to look up to them and give them the credit we feel that they so richly deserve. There's not many things we can celebrate. We can celebrate them getting medal appointments. We can, you know, and that kind of thing. But really, you know, they don't score goals. They don't make saves. So, you know, we don't do those things. But a milestone tally is a big thing. So um, I like to celebrate this and I think celebrating people's retirements is an important way to acknowledge the service that they've had. That being said, we need to find ways to do a lot better in recognizing and expressing our appreciation to umpires during their careers so that when they retire, they don't have those feelings of wanting to just go away because they're bitter. We don't want that. We don't want bitter umpires. We want umpires who are, maybe they need a break, but they're ready to come back and they're ready to give back to the next generation and make things better for the next generation. That was a process that I had to go through myself because the end of my career was not a great time at all. And it was something that I didn't talk about publicly. I. I wasn't live streaming at the time, obviously, but I didn't share. I didn't share that out. I didn't let people know really what was happening and why and the disappointments that had come with that. And I, I regret that in a way, not because you need to know more about me. You don't. But what you do need to know is that you're not alone. And the things that we all go through at every level from Olympic all the way, all the way down to recreational city league, the feeling isolated, feeling disappointed, feeling like you should have been treated better. The, the good things too, the incredible achievements, the great support, all that kind of stuff. You know, we need to connect so that you know that you're not alone when things happen. And that involves sharing. So when we, t when I talk about my failures, for example, I know I'm not doing that because I want you to know more about me and this is just spill time. It's because I want you to know that you're not on your own. So anyway, um, is there a thread on discord for this? What's this? Oh, for this live stream? No, there's not. Somebody could make one. No, because I want you all to comment here on the YouTubes. Carlos, Carlos, very warm welcome, sir. I'm not sure if I've seen you on, on the YouTube, so I'm gonna interpret that you're new. Thanks for coming. It sounds like umpires need to care for their mental health due to the pressures that they endure. Absolutely, that is a really good point. It's something that I had a, I had a long conversation with um, another retired FIH umpire, dear friend, Irene Cleland, who some of you may remember um, as being just a fantastic Scottish umpire. They keep churning them out, trust me, and Irene was, was, uh, was part of that for sure. Um, she now lives in Australia, but we had a conversation because this is 
this is part of her professional milieu as well, about, you know, what could we do to help? And this was, I think this was before COVID even hit and we were talking about mental health and pressure and yeah, we're, we'll, we'll get into this when we talk more about sort of decompressing the Olympic experience from a, from a big picture perspective, but you know, what could we do? And we both felt like we wanted to do something, but we were quite stymied. And part of that is because you're trying to bring together a group of people who are quite diverse and we didn't want to impose and we didn't want to be weird and we couldn't figure out the right facility for that. But it's, it's something that obviously all of us are becoming a lot more aware of, that we need to be out there and support. But it has to be something tangible. It's got to be specific. It's got to be something that actually, it isn't just words. It isn't just tweets that go out. It's, it, we've got to be taking some tangible action. And that's where I get stuck because that's not my, I just don't know enough about it. I'm not educated enough about it. So... Anyway, it is top of mind. It's something that I'm, I'm thinking about a lot. Um, one thing I have done in the Discord server, if there's anybody who's, um, any FIH umpires who are listening right now who aren't part of the Discord server yet, one of the reasons that everybody who goes onto the Discord server, and do I have a, do I have a scene? Do I have a scene for Discord? I don't know. Let's find out. I don't. Of course I don't. Okay, I'm not going to put that one on. Um, so if you go to, maybe Simon can put the link to fhumpires.com forward slash discord. One of the reasons that you express your role at the beginning is so that I can set up discussion areas for particular people. And one of those particular people are FIH umpires. So there is actually a little private area just for, just for them. And I've set it aside so that perhaps, <coughs> perhaps that's a place where we can start having these conversations and find out what what they need. How can we as a community help facilitate the support that they could benefit from? Give them a place where they can vent that they know is private, that they know nobody else is listening. And maybe that can, that can help. Thank you very much. Simon, if you put the HTTPS colon slash slash, then it'll be a hot link. And only you can do that as a mod. So everybody with a ranch cat, you can do that too. Uh, you can slap up the links up there. Or I could do it. Let's see. <laughs> I pressed a hot key. I pressed a hot key for the bumper. It's all good. Yeah, I know what happened. You just can't let me out, friends. Just don't let me out. Okay, so that should be hot linkable. Yeah. We'll see when it comes up. So yeah, let's let's talk about so now that we've we've looked at and I think those were all the milestones. And if I missed anybody, please do chime in in the comments and let me know if there is a golden whistle or something else that I, I missed in terms of milestones, but let's now talk about retirements. So I've been reposting everything that I've seen on the Twitters and such about retirements, but so far there's four confirmed from the Tokyo group. The link works great. First one that you've probably seen a lot of, Michelle Joubert is retiring. And this mm, is one of the more surprising ones for observers because she is not that close. I think she's only 42 or 43. So she's not that close to the retirement age. She's still got another five years to go. 47, the, the calendar year in which an FIH umpire turns 47 is the year at the end of December 31st, that year they have to retire. So surprise, if you didn't know that, that is why you don't see umpires um, of even if they could meet the fitness requirements, which they may, um, you don't see umpires in their 50s out there. 
And you might wonder, why do we have this arbitrary retirement age? If an umpire is good enough, they're good enough, right? And they did, three years ago now, toy with removing the age. And they did it for a year, and then they just instituted it back in without telling anybody. And they, 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 I know I keep saying the word they without naming who's happening, but part of that is because we don't always know who's making these decisions at the top. It's very, yeah. Um, it's very opaque at times, but between the FIH rules committee and the FIH umpiring committee, there is no longer an FIH officials manager. So there is nobody who is employed by the FIH to take care of the umpires and technical officials to advocate for them, to help advise on policy to the committees who are volunteers who um, end up making the policy. Basically other employees who are administrators just send out the missives, send out the appointments, send out the instructions, but there's nobody who's actually helping support them and helping helping communicate from the umpires back to the committees and the FIH in general and back to the umpires. There is no conduit for that right now. And there hasn't been since 2008 in the summer when the last FIH officials manager, Craig Gribbs, Craig Gribble, <laughs> good nickname Gribbs, stepped down. So it's not a good situation right now. And that is I believe part of the reason why we're seeing the retirements that we're seeing in addition to the age out retirements, as I'll call them, it's an umpire ages out. So Michelle Joubert, big loss, big, big loss. And it's not for me or for any of us to, you know, really conjecture as to why she felt the time is to step down. There is a podcast that just got released today, um, Hockey the Magazine. And if I can find a link to it, I will find it, but it's the South African publication. My friend Tyrone uh, Jabu Bernard and Derek Albers do that podcast and they've interviewed Michelle and it's just come out. So if you wanna have a listen to that, please go do that. And you can, um, you can see, I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet and see if Michelle talks about that, but you can understand that that probably isn't like the whole naked truth, right? But yes, it's a big loss to the game uh, in general. So uh, I'm very, I'm very sad to, to see that. But also with the South Africans, Peter Wright is aging out so we're losing him and he has formally announced his retirement as well. Simon Taylor of New Zealand, aging out. Um, also, I believe, but not confirmed. Sorry, I should go through the confirmed ones first before I start guessing. Carolina Del Fuente of the 200 Whistles. She is retiring um, for aging out as well. So those are the four. And I mean, Carolina is a five-time Olympic umpire, which is absolutely incredible. So she's, she's stuck around. She's gone through a lot in order to get to where she is. And I, all I can say is congratulations on a fantastic career. And I feel very lucky that I was able to be at a number of tournaments with her over her career and what a pleasure. She's just a fantastic person. So, um, so congratulations to those four for sure, who have formally announced their retirements. Other umpires that we are going to lose for aging out that I'm either fairly or absolutely certain of. Christian Blosch from Germany. So he got injured before Tokyo and needed surgery on his knee. I think it was about four weeks before Tokyo and had to withdraw. His replacement, Paco Vesquez, Beth Vesquez from Spain, is also aging out. So we will lose those two very experienced umpires. Um, 
I don't think there's many more from the women's side. It was a, it's, it's a fairly young grouping there, which is good to know. Um, but I can, I can look at the, the age there. Let's see. The link to the Discord will be in the YouTube live stream description as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, Steven Denman, is there a minimum age for FIH umpires? I think there is. I think it's, it's 18. Maybe I should just pull up a screen and we can see if I can find it. There's nothing wrong with this. This is not Inception. You are fine. Current applications. So I'm going to do not that screen, not that screen. It's just random, friends. It's just random. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to go way back into the FIH handbook, which is a very outdated document and where it won't be in briefings. Discipline? Regulations? I wonder if I deleted it. This is raw, friends. This is raw 2010. Okay, I have to sync it down first and then we can look at it together. There, now I can blank everything out. <laughs> oh, goodness. Checklists. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna search for minimum age. Nope, there isn't a minimum age, but, um, but yeah, we can talk about this because actually Hamish had this question in the Discord, so I'll, I'll go through this a little bit because Hamish had the question, how do you become an FIH umpire? I like how I have good call just hanging out up here. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a good question that I can't really answer in too, too much detail because it does vary from region to region and nation to nation. But the general process is that your national association has to recommend you to your continental federation as being an umpire who could meet the requirements of and meet the standard of being an international umpire. So it's a recommendation from your national association to your continental federation because your initial appointments and all your tournaments will be continental level tournaments that are under the auspices of the FH. So your first FIH tournament is not like a world level Olympic qualifier or a junior world cup or something like that. It'll be a continental championship type, like European championships too, or the Pan Am games or the Central American and Caribbean games, or maybe an invitational uh, even. Those will be your first experiences. So. For somebody like Hamish in Scotland, who's thinking, you know, hey, maybe this is something I want to get into. And I thought he was 18. He's actually only 16. Hamish, dude. 16 or 15. Very young. So what you need to focus on, if that's a goal that you might have, is to get to your national level and to get basically noticed and recommended by those folks in order to go forward. Now, when um, when you ask about, let's see, the minimum age for Stephen Denman, um, what, what we're finding now is that there's a big push, which makes sense when you work through it, but seems really unfair, but there's a really big push for new FIH umpires to start out at a young, young age. I started when I was 30. That was too late. And I can say that flat out now because I've got the hindsight of being much older than 30 now. I can look back on my career and I can see how my age and the 
point in my career at which I was exposed to international hockey and the opportunities to learn and grow and move up the ladder, how my career was limited because I started so late. And I'm proud of myself now because of how I was able to maximize the opportunities I had. Going over to England in 2006 was a huge, huge piece of that. If I had not done that, I never would have gotten my grade one rating. I never would have gotten to Olympic qualifiers and uh, a World Cup qualifier and things like that. And I was right on the verge of the, the uh, World Development Panel and didn't quite make it. I wouldn't have been on the road to London group had I not gone to England and gotten all that experience there. So, but starting early gives you the time to get the reps. It's, it's, it's all about experience. And I'm not saying that you have to have done a bulk of matches. And when I, when I analyze the careers of umpires who haven't seemed to umpire a lot of matches, but who have gone to high levels, like let's talk about Lorraine DeForge. She, she did start at a young age, she started when she was 18. And because she was an excellent player, she started doing the men's matches at an early age as well. So, she, but she was experiencing and she was processing games with an umpiring mind, even as she was a player, at a high level, at an early age. So even though she didn't have caps, she didn't, you know, as many caps as you would expect, she had that body of repetition of seeing mistakes being made of working through them of understanding them and then being able to employ that experience when she was on the pitch contrast that to somebody like me who at the age of 30 goes off to her very first tournament the central american and caribbean games in 2002 in puerto rico i had barely even seen an international match I'd barely seen a match of that caliber quality. I had no idea what I was walking into. I didn't have the reps. I only had domestic Canadian competition experience under my belt and it was very limited. And as a result of that, I was an absolute knife. I was just so green. <laughs> and then I spent the next 16 years trying to catch up to umpires who had started 10 years prior. And not only that, had started 10 years prior doing under 18 Europeans, under 21 this, under, you know, and, and got all this experience doing lower stuff. I got thrown into senior competition my very first tournament. Boom, go. My second tournament was the Pan Am Games. Crazy. So... What I'm saying is, is that it feels very much like if you're newer to umpiring, but maybe you're in your 30s, maybe in your 40s, and you're thinking, man, I'd really, I'd really love to become an FIH umpire. I think I have a lot to offer. You absolutely do. But what you have to understand as well is that you are very likely going to be limited in your career opportunities because you just don't have the time to get the reps you need to get good enough to be at that level. Harsh truth. This is real talk here. And it's coming from a place of love. But that's what we're dealing with. And then that leads into the question that I probably should have answered like 15 minutes ago, which was why there's a mandatory retirement age. 47's a weird year, I get it. But okay, they had to pick a year. Why not 47? Could be 48, could be 46, could be 50. Who knows, but they've picked 47. It's really important from an overall sport perspective to have new blood coming in. And as much as we'd like to think that as we get on and as we have built up our experience and we're moving into those years of our lives, 
that we will continue to learn, we will continue to adapt, we will continue to go. Goddard is a fantastic example of somebody who just continues to keep putting himself into positions where he is challenged and he learns and he keeps improving and keeps growing. People like Goddard are few and far between. And it just gets a little bit harder. It also gets harder from a political perspective to pass up on the experience that older umpires can offer in those games. Having this is like, it's almost like an excuse to say, oh, look, we just, we have to go with somebody younger. We don't have a choice. And that helps get more people into the game, more diverse opinions, more diverse approaches, new modern styles and all that kind of thing. So it keeps umpiring fresher and more experienced. One of my biggest fears as I've retired and now I'm moving into this role of umpire managing coaching and coming out here and, and talking to you friends all the time is that I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get out of touch and I'm gonna be talking about things that really worked 10 years ago, but not what works for the game now. I'm definitely afraid of that. And I've said, take me out back behind the barn. If you notice that's happening, well, maybe give me a chance to, to catch up first. But I want to be like Otters. He's my hero in that respect. I want to keep pushing and learning. And that's why I'm always talking to you. And this is a two-way conversation. So anyway, I that was a, lam a, a lambering rant, a rambling rant. But hopefully it gives you some information and context as to what's going on. Um, Simon's egging Rachel on for her second glass. I approve this message. Let's put that right there. Um, great umpires retiring opportunities for others to come through. Absolutely. And that's, and that's Goddard's you're, you're talking, talking about that principle that people will step up. And I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge as we move on into the next phases where we can contribute in different ways is that the game is going to continue. Umpiring will continue. The world is not going to fall apart just because we've moved on. People will take these opportunities. Now, I think we're in for a rough three years before Paris. I think things are going to be rough and people will not understand and they will not be supportive of the next generation of umpires growing into their new roles. And it's going to be really, really annoying for me to keep trying to remind people, would you just give them a chance to catch up? They are learning, they are growing, they are doing the best they can. And if they had just an ounce of support from the people they need it from, that's why I'm here. I'm trying to help provide a little bit of that support. But anyway, um, yeah, Brian, you haven't got that far in the podcast yet too, but hopefully there. Um, yeah, look, just, you just missed it. You just missed it by a day, Goddard. Such a shame. Is there a particular mindset that makes a successful umpire, Carlos? Oof. Well, let's, let's all talk about that because I'd like to hear your ideas. I think that a learner's mentality is, is one of the most important things. And for as stubborn and argumentative and aggressive as I come across, I am also, I believe, very, very coachable. And the reason that I'm so fueled by these conversations is, is because I'm taking on all the information that I'm getting. I'm still thinking about day 14 of Talking Tokyo when I tried, when I made an argument as to why Jubes gave that penalty stroke and a yellow card for the foul that happened inside her circle. That was probably, it stands out to me over the last year and a half as being the most difficult argument I've tried to win y'all over on. I'm not going to say it went across like a lead balloon, but I know that a lot of you still were going, hmm, Keely, not so sure about that. But I liked it because I liked knowing and getting the feedback that this didn't make sense to a lot of you. 
And I know it's a tough argument, the one that I was making. And that helps me continually reevaluate. I'm still trying to think, okay, was it the right call? Or was it the best call? Was it not the best call? Why? And I'm still thinking about it. I'm still turning it over my mind because that's how I roll. So I think a learner's mentality is crucial because you have to spend so much time as an umpire coaching yourself on the pitch. You don't often have the benefit. You don't have anybody yelling at you during a game. You don't have a coach on the bench doing that. You often don't have somebody like Goddard's or Simon hanging out, watching your games, taking notes, and then sitting down and debriefing you afterwards. Sometimes you do, sometimes you have assessments and you're getting that feedback. For those of you who are getting that on a more regular basis, you are so lucky. Keep that close to you because it's, it's really good. So having that ability to question yourself and to try to parse down in an analytical way, what happened? What are the principles? What did I do? How did the players react? How did it impact the game? Going through all those steps yourself in an objective way is such a critical skill, I think. James, hey friend. Being out with an injury for five years in your 20s killed your prospects of higher aspirations. I'm sorry to hear that. I really am. The upside is that it takes out any pressure to conform to what other umpires are under instruction be doing. That's, that's an interesting observation, James. I would, I would like to think, so I think you and I have talked about this on a few occasions and I've talked to everybody else about how, like it's one thing for us to chat and to be like, yeah, this is the right call. But as a community, it's really important for us to have consensus. And the consensus has to start at the top and it has to flow down. And I know that might sound a little like slave to hierarchy type stuff, which isn't really my personality. But it's important to do that just because that's the optimal way for information to flow because it goes from a small group of people and then outwards. It's really hard to get a whole bunch of people who are on an even level and then to funnel that information up the other way. It's, it's got to start somewhere and starting with the most experienced high level people and then coming all the way down probably is the best way to do it, logically speaking. So I still think, James, it's important to keep in mind that it may not be the most helpful thing for the matches in your area to, to be the rebel. And there's a very fine line to tread between calling things right because you know the principles better and and that sort of thing. It's a fine line between that and then bucking the system in a way that undermines everybody's credibility. Yours, everybody else's. So I'm not I'm not saying that you're doing things the wrong way. Absolutely not. I'm just saying that sorry, I have to turn off my notifications on my iPad because it drives me crazy. Here we go. Whoever's commenting on the Discord, come into the YouTube chat. Um, yeah, so just, just keep that in mind. I think the pressure that you aren't under now is just the freedom to just understand what's best for the game without necessarily conforming to what a, a, maybe a local umpire manager or coach is asking you to do that conflicts with that. And to have to play the political games that we all have to we all have to play and have had to play so i get that i totally get that that's a good comment oh good work thank you so much simon that's great and do subscribe it's a fantastic podcast ty and derek do a great job they're really good human beings um Um, Goddard's, I watch talk about top level umpiring all the time. So I'm still relevant growing. That's, that's my hope. <laughs> that's my hope. Um, but one of the interesting parts that I think people 
might overlook about my entire experience is that I, yes, I'm always watching the top level games, but I also watch mid-level, low-level international games when hopefully I have the opportunity to get out there as an umpire manager again. Um, you know, I, I won't I won't step into the World Cup. I will have opportunities within the PAF region doing, you know, lower level tournaments and things like that. So um, I'm not expecting, you know, so so I'll I'll get that sort of lower tier international experience. But then I'm out here in these streets in Calgary and occasionally at Canadian domestic tournaments. This is not high level hockey friends. And I'm coaching umpires. I am assessing umpires. I am umpiring at this level. I literally have the entire breadth, I think of hockey experience. So I really laugh when people are like, oh, you're, you're, you're a hockey snob. You don't understand what, what umpires need at the low levels. It's like, I am living, existing and breathing in the low levels, friends. I am grassroots underneath my fingernails. Trust me. So anyway, just wanted to make that point. Aline, you are finally back. You were in France. Oh, I know I missed you. You would have, you would have been blown away. They were very in depth and long. <laughs> they were a Keely hour every day. It was a lot. Listen and learn, be confident, calmness and ability to manage people. Those are the qualities, the mindsets that Goddard's believes umpires need to bring. Carlos, in your line of work, you call that flexible psychology being coachable. Yeah. Um, is it elasticity? Neuroplasticity. That's the word that I hear bandied about, which is an interesting word. I'm not, I've, I've read a little bit about it, but I'm not sure I completely understand it, but I've, I've heard that neuroplasticity is a vital component to a vibrant life and particularly aging beautifully as we're probably all interested in doing. For Neil, you need to be adaptable to an ever-changing game and willing to learn all the time. Once you think you know it all, then you're on a slippery slope downward, be calm and be able to move on from any mistakes. Absolutely. Aline, you did watch the Olympics until the end and you enjoyed it so much. Good, good. Like these, Aline, you are, you are the embodiment of the people that we're trying to find. People who don't play the game and yet want to watch the game. Like you, you're, you're, you're so vital to the future of this sport. You don't even know it. And if we had a million of you, we would be fine. Nobody would be worried about broadcast revenues and all that kind of stuff and getting butts in seats at matches. So thank you for your service to the game. Thank you for enjoying it so much. Uh, Rachel, if you ever come out of a game with nothing to learn, then you're either there or you're wrong. I agree. Oh my God. Thank you, Simon. How did that happen? So this is, this is good. Let's, let's just sag this into umpiring talent because we're having, we're having this nice philosophical conversation about umpiring skills and mindsets and all that kind of stuff. And I can't remember who said it on the discord, but somebody said, you know what? There's so much umpiring talent out there. Beautiful sentiment, beautiful sentiment that I completely disagree with. I really, really dislike the word talent. I really do. And I'm speaking as somebody who, when I was a kid, I went to a school for gifted children. And I spent a lot of time in my life being told I was talented, which then taught me that this was something that was outside of my control. It was something that I was born with, something that just magically appeared in my body. Now, you probably all know by this point that I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in any blessings or anybody endowing me from above or below with something, with attributes and such like that. 
So no, I don't believe in talent. What I see out there and what my experience has been as a human being is that some of us have the fortune to be put in situations where we can build skills. And those skills, whether they are physical, like athletic ability, dexterity, good balance, speed, fitness, anaerobic or aerobic fitness, whatever the case might be, whether those skills are mental, focus, logical decision-making, verbal acuity. I could, I could go on and on and on, but, but we are fortunate enough to be put in situations where we have the opportunity to build these skills and whether we know it or not, those skills are then brought into umpiring. So for example, right now, this, what you see here, me sitting here being able to talk to a piece of glass and that getting sprayed out over the YouTubes. This comes from the accumulation of skills that I've built in my life that I didn't even know had anything to do with this whatsoever. I don't have a talent for live streaming. I don't have a talent for video. I have skills that I've built because I took drama classes in school from grade four until grade 12. I was a drama queen. I competed in debates. I went to law school and I debated there. I was a lawyer for a few years and I debated there and I was, I got comfortable with public speaking. I did public speaking at conferences on legal technology issues for several years. So I've had all these experiences to get to this point. I've done 16 years of teaching umpiring certification courses, 16 years. I was like, holy smokes, that's a long time. That's a lot of classes. All of those skills, all of those experiences are built into what you see now. This isn't talent. When I look at umpires who are out on the pitch, whether I know what those experiences were or not, I know that they've done things in their lives that have all contributed to where they've gotten to now. Because you just don't spring out of the womb doing anything other than sleeping, eating, pooping. <laughs> That's it. So the reason that I find this important the reason that I wanted to bring this up with you all is because I know that I'm talking to a whole bunch of umpires who are at a variety of stages of their career, all the way from people like me and Simon and Goddard's and, and that sort of thing, all the way down to the Hamishes and the Neils and, you know, youngsters who are just starting out and everybody in between people who are just starting umpiring in their fifties, people who are in their thirties, who are considering how hard do I want to push to the next level? What, where am I best suited to give back to the game? People in their twenties who are thinking, is this my time to get to the next level? Am I, could I make international? Could I make national level? Could I make regional, whatever the case might be? So I know you're all out there in this, in, in these various places in your lives. And in the context of what I talked about with age requirements and getting to the top, 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 that's great. But all of us are in a position where we can improve because our skill acquisition is entirely within our control. There are, there's so much information out there on the internet, courses that you can take to improve your speaking presentation skills, your posture, things that can improve your fitness, things that can improve your, your physiological state of being and your calmness and your focus. I mean, name it and you can find it. Even if you can't find people around you who can help you with those skills, even if your job or your schooling or whatever the case might be, isn't focusing on those things. Those things are out there and the information is there. You truly can learn to improve anything. 
that you decide to. I'm not gonna sit here and say you can do anything you wanna do because that's just not the case. But there are very few things in umpiring that you have to be born with. Even something like physical attractiveness. And I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years about how much being good looking is important in umpiring. Because I don't think that it's, it's a coincidence that you, you look at top umpires and you're like, you know, that's a pretty good looking bunch of people. Like, there are, they are. But it doesn't come from their genetic, you know, where their eyes were put in their face and their nose and, you know, all that kind of stuff and whether they have good hair. It's how they carry themselves. It's their personality. It's who they present, the inner self that they present out there and their willingness to be vulnerable and to be comfortable and to be themselves out on that stage. That's what makes them charismatic and interesting and compelling and somebody that you wanna follow, somebody you believe, somebody who can convince you that that decision was correct. Somebody who you can build rapport with, somebody you feel understands you. Those are all the qualities that we get from something like a physical attractiveness. So even that is something that you can build on and you can learn. I've mentioned before that my time in my international career, I was not a very friendly, I, I was not a charismatic umpire. I was accused of being robotic on some of my re tournament reports. I didn't learn how to be this until I got into this setting where I was able to pull upon my skills and I was able to get over myself and realize that I just needed to be, I just needed to share myself with you guys. And all of a sudden that created the connection. That's what was needed. And the best umpires know how to do that. So that's very, very long stories. So what I want you to take away is that you are not limited to where you are now. You can improve everything and anything that is there. I'm not saying you could become Michelle Joubert at any point. I'm not saying you can, eat, you can do that overnight. I can't, I'm not saying you can do that in 20 years, but you can absolutely improve. And that journey, that growth, ask Goddard's, ask Simon, that growth is what keeps them going and brings them joy every day. It's not being at the top. It's continuing to improve. Wow. <laughs> I've been very philosophical this week. It's probably because I've been still, you know, I finally recovered and now I'm, I, it's like I've gone through a, a purge. <sighs> and I've got all these things. Time, thank you, Simon. Reminding me with the clock, 10 minutes to real hour. Goddard is quite right. That's partly why umpires encourage to have personal development plans. Yeah. And we, we don't do enough to focus on the personal part. We just kind of make it an individual development plan, but it's not about the person. So we need to talk more about that and be better at supporting that with umpires that we work with. That's a really good point. The only thing you need to be born with to enable umpiring at the moment anyway are two eyes. Although some out there always believe they don't work. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Sounds like the best umpires know how to do group therapy. Yeah, I, I think they do. But I think also we don't want to assume that they can do all this stuff on their own. Okay. And they deserve the help. They do enough on their own. They hire personal trainers. They watch clips, they watch matches, they initiate discussions, they have their own support groups, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just make things a little bit easier for them? I agree. Rachel's onto the scotch. This is group therapy. It is, it is. Thank you, James. Philosophy's where it's at. Okay, so the last topic, <laughs> let's move on to that. Thank you for letting me 
ramble and talk about these things that have been on my mind a lot over the last few weeks. But our last topic is something that's come up several times and will continue to come up for time immemorial, which is cards. And specifically, let's just focus on the issue of cards to the same player. So I'm interested for you, whether you and your the umpires in your region have an agreement as to how you card the same player in a game. So if a player, for example, hits the ball away after a free hit that has been awarded against them. They hit the ball away, they're wasting time. You would give that player a green card. They come back on the pitch and 10 minutes later, they commit a stick obstruction breakdown tackle. They stop the advancement of good play and they throw in a stick tackle. What would be the consensus in your area and in your mind as to how you would handle that situation first. Just brushing up. Goddard's coaching, helping others improve your own umpiring. Oh my God, so much, so much. <laughs> B- bottles are a nice accompaniment, but they're not the only thing that you need, obviously. Okay, so what would you, what would you do in that situation? So some people have very um, rightly but also weirdly pointed out the back of the umpiring handbook, which friends, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I have not looked at for so, 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 so long. So I'm going to pull this out. If you don't know that this place exists here (laughs) back umpiring objectives. Okay. I got to get rid of this. Good call. (laughs) <laughs> there okay back to our regular scheduled programming okay this section of the rule book has not been touched since i started collecting rule books which was in 2000 it has not been touched it talks about general principles of advantage and possession and how possession is not automatically advantage they must be able to develop their play um you know all that kind of stuff and then there's guidance on cards and so people have sometimes brought this out and said well hey keely 2.4 2.3 in the rule book is you know indicate something that's not what you recommend And remember, I'm really trying to recommend things that I know are within agreement or consensus, maybe not in your area, but in other places, areas. And I've got the Discord link up there. Turn off. There. Okay. And I'm like, well, yeah, but this section hasn't been updated for so long. I'm not surprised. So for example, this sub D, cautions can be given in close proximity without stopping the match. That has been interpreted and we went through a phase of time where people thought that that meant that we didn't necessarily have to stop time in order to give a card. And that shit did not work out whatsoever. So that is not commonly accepted practice okay and everything in this section in this whole section of the rule book is not a rule this is all just guidance of commonly accepted practice at the time when it was written maybe so what 2.3e recommends with uh with umpires and Oops, I blocked that scene. Is that a player could receive two green cards or two yellow cards for different minor offenses during the same match. It is possible that umpires are not encouraged to do so, to give two greens or two yellows. However, when an offense for the sick card has already been awarded and is repeated, 
and it doesn't specify repeated by the same player or by the same team or in the match, the same card must not be used again and a more severe penalty must be awarded. You could infer from the language that what they're trying to say is that it's a, um, it is the same player, but I'm not entirely sure, friends. I'll move that out of the way so you can see it. So I'm interested to hear what you guys think about that, because I have thoughts. And I'm going to put on my glasses. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Needing someone else. Needing to explain to someone else really helps. Yes. Sorts out your thoughts. Okay. Simon, the advice you had on this in the first instance, green, second yellow, if they do it again, 10 minute yellow, if they do it again, 50 minute yellow and so on. Yeah. Florian. Hey friend. First green, second yellow. Thomas. Knee jerk is yellow, but if a low impact stick tackle green, if their first card was a five minute yellow, then the next um, and any more is a 10 and less red. For Lou, card progression, Scott. My colleagues and I did say that if a player has received a green card, they won't get another green card, even if the offense was completely different, okay? Also, if a player had already got a five minute yellow card, the next would have to be at least a 10 minute yellow card. And this is more about manage the individuals. Stick a pin in that point. Luke, so do we see the progression as green, yellow, red or green, yellow five, yellow 10, red. Okay, so that gets into whether a player should take two yellows or not. Tomas, I once had a game where I gave a five minute for dangerous play and then second half, my colleague gave a green to the same player for a poor tackle. Looking back, it worked for us in controlling the game. Interesting. James, no stopping time for a green card is still the accepted practice instruction. We're often given here the kind of instruction I no longer feel under pressure to hear to. Okay. You're allowed to rebel against that. Because I hate that. I just, I, I just, it's just when you're working with a technical table, it doesn't make logical sense. Because if the table knows that every time you're giving a, a card that you're going to do this, you're going to give a card and then you're going to call time back in. It makes it easy for them to manage. They know what their job is. But if all of a sudden you've blown a whistle and you pull out a card and suddenly a player's running towards them, they might not know what ha what's happened. Okay. The stop time isn't just because you have to stop the game. It's because it gets everybody's attention. I guess what I'm saying is I don't see a logical reason for this. We're talking seconds here. Seconds that are put back onto the clock, not spent. It's tidier. It helps the constructive parts of the game to be, it helps all the time that is spent in the game to be more constructive rather than being wasted by a bunch of players standing around watching a player going running off with a card. Just, I don't get it. I don't get it. Rachel, you've always gone up the elevator when the same offense occurs with the same team. Okay, that's, yep, that's a good point too. And I don't, I don't necessarily want to get into like every single scenario that we can do with carding because otherwise I'm not going to fit this in the next 20 minutes under Achille hour. So to me, when Luke pointed out that this, when you're carding players from multiple offenses, this is about managing the individual. That is exactly the point that I want you to focus on. Cards are personal messages to a single player, as well as warnings to everybody else. But we have a whole bunch of guidelines. And when we, and I, I brought them up over and over again during the Olympics from the Tokyo briefing and from the general FIH briefing, that here are the guidelines to when you give a green and when you give a yellow and you don't necessarily, the control elevator, it doesn't have to go bang, 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 bang. When different offenses and different scenarios occur with the different teams that you might be stepping down and then moving back up again and then going up to floor three and then coming back down to floor one. That's okay. 
and that manages things effectively. But when it's the same player, to me, this, as I'm pointing at my screen that you guys can't see, this sub E, I don't agree with it. I do not agree that a player can receive two green cards for different minor offenses during the same match. Because I think you get into the situation where you are introducing yet another variable that doesn't need to be introduced, another variation in the control ladder process because that player has very specifically been told what you did was incorrect. You need to go sit down for two minutes and think about what you've done. You need to play within the scope of the rules, friend, in order to re-enter the pitch. So you're going to sit for two minutes and then you're going to be allowed to come back. You get into hair splitting scenarios and people have asked me, well, if somebody commits a stick obstruction breakdown tackle and then they commit a body obstruction breakdown tackle, those are two, two different offenses, right? It's like, oh my God. Right? So you can see that you start getting into different definitions of what a different offense might be. And you just don't have to do it because it's a very personal penalty to that player. Don't wreck the game. Go sit down and then you can come back. So that, to me, that individuality of that message there's no excuse. There's no excuse for that player not to know what's expected of them. Um, let's see. James, if you've given a yellow card and the person commits a foul that would only be worth a green card, it feels too much to jump to that to an automatic red card. Sometimes a red card might be right, just not automatically. Okay, so now we're talking about yellows. Let's pin that. I started. I started. Not that I started it, but I starred it. With about, without a bench, you have to stop time to make your own notes. That's another thing, right? Is that it gives you the opportunity to fully, and you're not taking time away from the teams unless you're playing like a confined period of time block, which is a consideration in some leagues. But if you can't take two seconds, where you know that the play has to stop and the players can't play the ball so that you can just J -j 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 take your pen right on your hand like I do. Steve, Scotters, time stop can create a calm down period. It's an effective management tool. You've never given two green cards to the same player, but two player, two yellows, yes, it can be effective. James, the issue isn't as harsh going from a green card to an automatic yellow card next, so you're inclined to do that. Okay, even when you're mic'd up, you'll still stop. Okay, so we've got that agreement. So it sounds to me like everybody here agrees that if a player gets a green card, they can take another green card. So let's move on to what James is saying about the yellow card scenario that it feels too harsh to go from a player receiving a yellow card and then receiving a, a, a red card or what could be called a technical red because what they did wasn't an outright red card I had a really good chat with David Alcock who is one of the best FIH technical officials in the world and an excellent umpire in his own right about how at international levels and below in his experience that situation is recorded on the match sheet. So I wanted to find out, okay, what are the mechanics of that? So if a player receives a yellow card and in the umpire's discretion, they give a yellow, the second yellow, and they replace that with a red, how do you record that on the match sheet? And he said, actually, you write another yellow and then you write a red card at the same time. Said, Why? Why? Because they're not serving both. 
They're only serving a red card. He says, yeah, really good question. So he's thinking about that. I put that bug in his brain. So my question to you, James, and to everybody else listening who's also have the tendency like, oh, it seems a little harsh. What personal message are you sending to a player when they receive a yellow card? That particular player, they have committed something either that's happened before and they did anyway. Probably that their team did. So one of their teammates went off and did that same thing and you sat them off. You're like, well, that's probably the third time it's happened because you probably gave a verbal warning the first time and then there was a green card and then there was a yellow card for this three times. Three times that's happened and then the same player is going to come back and do something for a fourth time. So think about what message did you intend to send with that five minute yellow card? And why you think that player should be able to re-enter the pitch, come back on the field and continue participating in that game. So I worked with, Brian's probably here still, maybe he's still here. I worked through this with Brian because they're going through this in his local area, trying to figure out what they're gonna do, especially in indoor hockey, where apparently they were having a lot of problems with players taking two yellow cards. And he was indicating to me some examples of where players just didn't seem to understand the rules, but they were coming in and committing really, really rash, dangerous tackles because they didn't understand how to play. And he's like, it doesn't feel right to give a, a, to turn that second yellow into a red card for that kind of player. And I said, does it feel right to bring that player back into the game where they can commit that same foul for a third time? Does it seem right to bring that player back into the game where they can, can commit another game-breaking foul? Where they could come in and they could put another player in danger. Does that feel right? The reply that I had from Brian is that, and many of you are probably going to be chiming in, I'm going to check the comments right now to see, that there are administrative penalties, automatic bans that are attached to red cards in your area. And that's an excellent point. But should that change what you do on the pitch? Because your job isn't to control the league. Your job is to control the match that's in front of you to make sure it's played safely and played fairly. That is your num that is the only reason that you're there, friends. Job numero uno. It's not to take into account what might happen to that player afterwards or what is going to happen because those penalties are administered in a way that is unfair. Mandatory bans are in essence unfair. They're put in place because when you give discretion to certain administrative bodies, they make dumbass decisions. That's why it's there. But the problem is that it doesn't fit all situations. James, the message you intend to send is I didn't like what you did, usually on a physical foul. Thus, if they commit a more technical strategic foul in the midfield, usually green card, you're still happy that they got the first message. Yep. Um, let's see. Neil, your colleague at the time was an FIH and he agreed with your explanation of the two greens. Where was your explanation of the two greens? You did, oh, here it is. One was a breakdown, the second was a green to each team for nudging each other off the ball after both teams had had a verbal warning. Okay, so let's talk about this because this kind of gets into something that I believe 
is a separate category of behavior. There are personal messages that you send that are things that affect the play at the time. And then there's misconduct, usually dissent. Dissent is the one time, the one exception that I would give to the double card rules, because that is a piece of misconduct that isn't about what happens with the other team. It's what happens with you as the umpire. So if somebody said to me, I gave a green for a breakdown tackle over there, and then I gave a green for descent, I still don't, I still don't like it. It still doesn't feel right. A yellow for a breakdown, physical tackle. And then they gave a green for descent. That Maybe, maybe, I still don't like it. The problem is, is that if we aren't sending clear messages that players don't understand that there are consequences and that they are basically on a watch list after they've done something wrong, you can end up in a situation, like how far does it go? How many extra chances do they get? And, you know, James, you said that, you know, well, definitely when it's dangerous, you're going to do something. But it's, are you giving them an opportunity to do that? Instead of removing them from a game that they didn't like. My question always in scenarios like this too is, was there another way you could handle this? Did you have to give a card? Was that the only option in order to intervene in this situation? Um, okay, so Chicken McMcMeal, great name. Don't you go two, five, ten, red, traffic item. I think so. I think so. Okay, so here, here we're, we're getting into the, the mandatory bans. There's a 16 day minimum suspension for a straight red, no such suspension for a technical red. Okay, so there you go. There's a clarification of what they do in Simon's area in England. Five minutes to Achilles hour. Thank you, Simon. See that? For 100% technical completeness, that doesn't exist in our game, but thank you for the effort. A player can totally have two or three or even four yellow cards for the exact same fence. It just has to be for moving a foot early when defending a penalty stroke. Why do you say that? I want to know. Where does that come from? Stain believes you can't scale down with cards. Cards tell a player he she is off limits and need to get back on track. That's what I think. That's what I think. Because we're not just addressing the way that something affects the game. And that's the danger of the briefing, the way that it's worded now. I kind of like it, but I kind of don't like it. Because that's what team penalties are for. There was that time at band camp where I expressed the sentiment that team penalties are about putting back the opportunities that were taken away and evening the scales. Balancing the scales of justice. Personal penalties are messages independent of that that also have a team consequence so that they really have impact, but they're not meant, they're not meant to penalize the team. They're meant to send the message to the player. So when you say, well, this one's technical, but this one really had an impact on the game and was very dangerous. So the technical thing, we're not really, you know, no, I don't want to scale it up. It's like, but what about, what does that say to the player? What is the message that's sent? So no, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I'm not convinced yet. I'm not convinced yet. It just, it puts a bad hockey feeling in my stomach. Make my stomach feel better. This is very awkward. And I'm still waiting for James to tell me about the moving the foot early on a penalty stroke. Because I want to see, see why he thinks that. 
and for further offenses with a yellow card. That is one hell of a literal reading of that provision that I have not heard before. So that literally applies that it's going to be the same a player each time. This player may be cautioned and for any subsequent offense, and it's not, it's not written as for any subsequent offense by this player. It, you can apply that, but it's not necessarily written that way. Sorry, legal interpretation coming into play. This player may be cautioned See, it could be an entirely separate provision. That's an interesting interpretation, James, and I'm gonna have to think on that. Not that this has ever happened. Like, I'm sure it's never happened to you that you've had a goalkeeper who has moved early on a penalty stroke and you've greened them. So they've gone off for two minutes. And then another player has come in to defend that penalty stroke could be a goalkeeper could be somebody else and either that player or the original goalkeeper comes back in does it again and you haven't have it to give a, a yellow card and then they've done it again or one of their teammates has done it again like has that ever happened to you never happened to me hmm I'm going to have to think about that one. Um, let's see. So Stain, just following up on his comment from before. Sorry, here, let me do this. And said, can't scale down with cards, especially so when you start with a yellow. Yeah, it's just, what are you saying? I keep saying those words. And I'm not sure if I'm expressing that very well. Goddard's messaging can take many forms, not just cards. I never go from a yellow to a green. Two yellows possible for completely different offenses with a longer suspension. What's a completely different offense? The only completely different offense that I can think about is dissent. And even then, I'm thinking if a player comes at me with dissent <laughs> after I've already cautioned them for a physical breakdown tackle or one that had a big impact in the game or was the third or fourth time that it happened in a game and other interventions had been given they come out with a dissent after that it's like really really do you really want to play <laughs> no you don't you're just disrupting this game you're making it unfair and you're making it unsafe rachel you've occasionally gotten the personal versus team penalties mixed up but you're doing better now good to hear if a player gets two yells, he, she must be a numpty. <laughs> Woo, strong wording. And if they get a red instead, then no sympathy. Also, what is the captain or coach doing to control the player? Like, that's the thing is that you're not giving these messages because it's like time served, now go back and do things normally. It's like, no, this is a, this is a warning. This is an actual, like, don't do this again. You did it again, holy smokes, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> Scaling down fewer ref relates to different players. Yes, for instance, for Neil, a 10 minute slide tackle offense can always go back to greens for stick out by somebody else on the team. Yeah, yes, I agree with that. Absolutely. So like we're going through the hypotheticals of all the different things, but yes. Yeah, you can't imagine it ever happening. Thank goodness. Thanks for the hypothetical though, James. If there's anybody who's gonna take us to the far reaches of what could happen in a hockey game, it's gonna be you. And I appreciate that about you. Uh, you wouldn't want to be giving a third choice goalkeeper a straight red for moving their feet early just because two other people already did. I don't know. What are you watching? Did you not see the other times? And well, think about the opposition. Think about the opposition. It's like, 
How many of these strokes are they gonna, are they gonna intentionally cheat on? Right? You don't, it's unfair. It's unfair to them. You think it, it requires being read as the same person, but that requires the same goalkeeper having to fan at least three different strokes and foot fouling on all of them. Yeah, I know, right? Only ever one red, says Rachel, but second yellow for bad tackles both times. Thomas, what if? Favorite. Language 133. Okay, just a couple more minutes, guys. What if the captain gets a yellow, say, five minutes and then has too many players on the pitch? Do we give 10? That's a good one. <coughs> Sorry, and that's an argument for two different offenses because the captain is taking one for the team, literally. So yeah, I can see that one. Let me think about that more too. Let's 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 revisit that, Thomas. Don't let me forget it, okay? Luke, if a player has a five minute yell for knocking the ball away and does it again. Are we saying red? Yes. <coughs> I am. Getting confused, some saying five to ten. No, for me it's a red. <coughs> Same player. To me, it's it's second yellow turns into a red. They don't get a 10. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, now that I'm having a coughing fit, it's probably a good time to stop so that I don't continue this. I will. Sorry. I'm okay. I'm not going to be here next week. I go on holidays. I go to California on Friday. And I'm very excited about it. I'm going to go kayaking with friends. And then we're going to Big Bear, and it's going to be a good time. So I won't be here next week. I will see you the last week of August. And then we are getting into September, and things are going to get good. Because you guys are going out on the pitch. And you guys are going to be so hyped and ramped up. I'm so excited for you. So let's do some fun things. You have things that I need to talk about. Please send them to me on the Discord server. So let's see if I have a graphic for that. I don't know if I do. Buy me a coffee. Nope, I don't. FHEmpires.com forward slash. Oh, Stain, you have no idea how much I'm going to enjoy this. It's just going to be amazing. Um, make sure you head over and join in because the discussions are fantastic. I'm really enjoying being able to interact with you all on a regular, ongoing, continuous community building basis. And there's so many other people in there who are contributing great knowledge. So please head over to Discord. It's going to be awesome. Goddard, thank you. I am going to have a great holiday. And it's, yes, I have earned this one. I'm excited. Where's the red wine? What? I know, I know, but I can't because I'm moving <laughs> stuff. Okay, have a fantastic, fantastic rest of your Wednesday or your Thursday or wherever you're at. If you're replay squad, put that in the comments so that I can make sure I can get to your questions. Thank you very much, Rachel. I've, <clears throat> I think I've gotten over my little coughing fit there. You're very welcome, Brian. It was great to have you all along and we will see you in two weeks. What up Wednesday? Be good to yourselves. Bye.